And we're at the top of the hour. So thank you for joining us, everyone. This is the publishing methods session. Say that three times fast. Uh, I'm Kelly Chatain. I'm an associate archivist with the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan. And I'm very happy to be chairing this session today. Uh, we have three presentations and a full docket here. So we'll be holding questions till the end of the session. Please use the Q&A area in the Zoom app to post your questions. And of course, use the chat for more informal discussions or other thoughts that come up during the presentations. Without further ado, I will introduce our first speakers. And if Chelsea and you would like to share your screen at this moment, our first presentation is integrating self-publishing platforms within established data repositories. Chelsea Goforth is a senior data project manager at ICPSR, where she manages the Millennium Challenge Corporation Evidence Platform and formerly managed OpenICPSR, ICPSR's self-publishing platform. She has over 15 years of data-related social science research and project management experience. Chelsea is a doctoral candidate in political science at the University of Virginia and holds a master's degree in education policy and a bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from the University of Michigan. Karani Renault joined ICPSR in September 2020 as a data project manager. There she manages open ICPSR as well as the general archive. Prior to ICPSR, Karani worked in the nonprofit sector in Chicago, Illinois, conducting nursing workforce and longitudinal health studies. Karani received her Master of Arts in Public Policy and Administration from Northwestern University. And Jared Lyle is an archivist at ICPSR, where he directs the Metadata and Preservation Unit, which is responsible for metadata, the bibliography of data-related literature, and digital preservation. He also serves as the director of the Data Documentation Initiative. Take it away. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, so today, uh, Chelsea, Karani, and I are going to be talking about our own experiences with Open ICPSR, ICPSR self-publishing platform. Yeah, let me just advance. So ICPSR has been around for almost 60 years. I think we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this uh, fall, really starting those celebrations. And we've been uh, curating many, many studies for all these years. Um, you probably know what our studies look like. They're richly curated, they're enhanced, they have great metadata and they're available for reuse uh, by anyone who comes to our site. About a decade ago, we discussed moving to uh, providing a self-publishing system at ICPSR and kind of entering the fray. These are some of the self-publishing options that are available today. This was in response to some of these funder mandates that said you should make your data uh, available uh, to any user at no cost. And so in 2012, we put out a beta version of our self-publishing system called OpenICPSR. And since uh, this is uh, just an example of what a self-published project looks like uh, when it, once it's uh, been released. So OpenICPSR, as opposed to the curated collections at ICPSR that are richly enhanced, they get disclosure reviews and get um, some additional enhanced functionality, the open ICPSR collections are available as is. There's no review or enhancement by ICPSR, um, including disclosure reviews, uh, but they're immediately available. So anyone can come in and post their content uh, that same hour, and then it's usable by anyone. Uh, we also have an open ICPSR for repositories uh, system which is our branded, fully hosted repositories for institutions, organizations, journals. Uh, they have some customized functionality. Uh, there's been some uh, success with this self-publishing system at ICPSR. Uh, so if you look in our catalog and sort by recently published collections, um, about eight out of every 10 uh, studies or projects that are published 
in our system are now from a self-published collection. This was taken just from today. And then many of the, the journals, so we're working with the American Economic Association, many of their top journals are now uh, published, the, the data from them are published in open ICPSR. Several of our collections have been published in high impact journals. Uh, I have a list that Elizabeth Moss, our librarian who's responsible for our bibliography of data related literature sent me with many, many uh, open ICPSR collections published in uh, high impact and, and just a, even uh, low impact journals, a wide range of, of journals. So people are able to make their data uh, accessible and available. So there've been um, some really fun things with it. There have also been some challenges and I like this uh, comic from uh, the New Yorker that shows Moses at the top of the mountain with the tablets and uh, saying, you sure you wanna go the self-publishing route? Uh, I feel the same way with uh, uh, open ICPSR at times, um, along with the pros and the, and the benefits come some challenges that are unique. And so that's what we wanna talk about today, highlight the benefits, I'll talk about the challenges that we've experienced or some of them, and then the lessons learned. I think we're in a unique position in that we have been this established repository that's largely worked on curation, curated collections, and now we have this uh, dual stream. And so we wanna uh, share with some of those uh, challenges and, and benefits, and especially the lessons learned today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Karani to take uh, over the next part on benefits. Thanks, Jared. So uh, providing a self-publishing option for XPSR has offered several benefits, especially since not everything needs to be curated. Jared, next, please. Some scenarios where self-publishing is beneficial are with replication studies. So uh, these studies are, are uh, particularly suited for self-publication because their results are published immediately and they're able to be replicated and verified in a timely manner. Also with replication studies, having the ability to structure and upload a zip file in a way that requires no manual modification means that the code and data can be run more easily when downloaded by secondary users. Another scenario where self-publishing is beneficial is for uh, already curated collections by the original data collector. Some data arrive you know, in, at the data repository in, a great, in great shape and further enhancements are not always needed or may not provide added value. And if the original data producer does a thorough job and does the creation themselves, these projects can usually be distributed as is. Also, um, curation, as we know, takes time, sometimes weeks, months, and data sometimes needs to be uh, released immediately. For example, raw data associated with journal articles that has specific deadlines. And also we're seeing more and more funding agencies require grant recipients to make the research data accessible to the public and they need that immediate publication as well. Next, please. Also, we've seen that uh, with creating a self-publishing repository, we are able to be a test bed for new services and functionality. So we, um, next we shared, these include upon demand citations that become immediate, uh, immediately available. Next. Also, we provide file level metadata and file level citations. Um, you can see that in the screenshot here. This allows for file and folder level granularity, including the ability to download subdirectories. Next. Also, we have the, uh, you have the ability to add customized licenses. So here in the screenshot, you'll see a list of 15 licensing options, including the other option where researchers can upload a customized license along with their, along with their deposit. And with that, I will pass it on to Chelsea to speak about the challenges. Thanks, Kirani. Yes, yeah, so with all of the good uh, and the benefits that uh, Karani mentioned, that all comes with challenges as well, including potential tensions between self-published and curated collections related to repository staff, users, development, and policies. Uh, next slide, please, Jared. 
Compared to ICPSR's curated collections, uh, there's much more variance in the quality of metadata and materials among self-published projects. So although Open ICPSR offers many fields to provide opportunities for robust description, as you can see from this particular example on the slide that is particularly well documented, uh, many self-published projects do not provide this kind of adequate description to aid in either discoverability or replication. Next slide, please. Very closely related, uh, due to the low barrier to entry and just the sheer quantity of deposits uh, that we get in open ICPSR, content of all sorts can be much harder to moderate, which just invites more leniency. Uh, as I just mentioned, metadata in particular, of course, can be especially variable. A contributing factor there is that open ICPSR doesn't pull from the main ICPSR thesaurus, and so a lack of these controlled vocabularies can affect self-published subject terms in particular. The uh, we also generally state that data cannot be connected that the data that data that cannot be connected with or used to expand on the scientific investigation of the social dimensions of human lives, as well as documentation files or publications without accompanying data or code should not be deposited in open ICPSR as standalone projects. And yet we're open to breaking these rules, uh, or at least interpreting them very broadly. Um, especially when we're working with specific repositories. So for example, one, one of our repositories doesn't require data at all, and we more or less let them define those boundaries for themselves. And lastly, we occasionally have to deal with more egregious deposits that are attempting to use the self-publishing platform for their own advertisements or copyrighted materials, or even pornography or other illicit materials. And in these cases, it is much more straightforward to make the decision to unpublish those projects. Next slide, please. ICPSR self-publishing services are consistent with ICPSR's overall mission to advance and expand social and behavioral research by acting as a global leader in data stewardship and providing rich data resources and responsive educational opportunities. And although the richness of these resources is much more variable than in our curated collections, as we've discussed, ICPSR views its self-publishing platform as complementary to its curated collection for many of the reasons that Kirani has already mentioned. So depositing data projects in open ICPSR does not in fact preclude curation services at a later date and can aid in more immediate discovery. That said, it's not necessarily easy to move a self-published project into the queue for curation, which represents just one of the technological challenges, um, albeit a large one, resulting from silo development between ICPSR's curated system and self-publishing system. So long term, we expect to implement what we're calling single stream depositing, which will better connect these two systems, in addition to a completely new data model to allow for more flexible ingest and dissemination of a wider variety of object types across both systems. Uh, and to that last point, we've also discovered that such flexibility can be both a benefit and a challenge. Uh, we've experienced the shortcomings of our infrastructure, given the myriad ways in which depositors and repositories are able to use and thus also tax ICPSR systems. Our growing pains have included constraints due to volume and size, overall numbers of files and folders, accommodating varying file types. And although we've worked through many of these issues in turn, we do expect that we will continue to discover others as we continue making many of these technological strides. Back over to you, Jared. Thanks, Chelsea. So lessons learned, uh, three main ones that we wanna highlight. One, embrace the unique, uniqueness and divergence of the collections. So yes, open ICPSR content may be more like the soup cans on the left in the middle, uh, where they're not well described or as well described as a fully curated product like the can on the right. Um, but there are some uh, acceptance of those trade-offs that may be beneficial to the repository, including timely releases that uh, can be used to improve curation queues. The second would be integrate processes. So when Open ICPSR was first established over a decade ago, um, the systems, as Chelsea mentioned, were set up uh, in separate stacks, isolated, um, somewhat on purpose. Um, one idea behind that would be to uh, keep some of the metadata separate um, because self-published uh, content can be published immediately. That means it would populate some of our catalog entries. And the concern was that it would, um, it would decrease or devalue um, some of those uh, metadata entries in the catalog uh, because they weren't uh, highly uh, curated or systematized. 
Um, but what we found is because the, the systems are not integrated uh, now, we're, we're running into difficulties. So one example that Chelsea mentioned would be moving a self-published project over to curation, to our curation system, um, to have it uh, fully enhanced by our, our expert teams. Um, and so if at all possible, you're considering uh, building a self-publishing system, um, try to, to work through and make it possible to integrate the systems from the beginning so you won't run into these, these same troubles. The third lesson is uh, this opportunity for continuous feedback. So uh, one good example of this is our partnership with the American Economic Association. Just the sheer number and type of uh, files that are deposited there are unique. They're different than what we typically get in our regular deposits. And so it's allowed us to consider how to address these new file types, uh, these new formats, improve and enhance our system. Another example would be with the American Economic Association um, they've asked us to customize their own repository instance so that there's a workflow that they use to submit deposits um, so that deposits are reviewed by them before they're, they're published. And so that's new functionality that we could uh, potentially make available to other journal systems and other organizations that's beneficial. So this through this continuous feedback um, from our users, we're able to improve not just open ICPSR, but all of ICPSR systems. So with that, we thank you for um, listening to us. And I think we're gonna take your questions at the end of the session, um, but feel free to add them to the Q&A uh, chat box. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. And thank you for sharing some of those uh, learning experiences. It's always nice to hear what works and what doesn't work. All right, our second presentation today is Form Fumbles Function. Do university IR deposit forms deter data discovery? And we have two speakers. Sean Nicholson provides leadership and vision for several units and centers at Michigan State University libraries, including data services and the Turfgrass Information Center and the Vincent Voice Library. His scholarly interests center on the use and reuse of data and attendant processes and protocols for long-term stewardship. Sean has led study abroad courses to Ireland, New Zealand, Spain, and Italy, and looks forward to a post-pandemic return to Italy next summer. And how. Uh, Terence Bennett is currently the business and economics librarian at the College of New Jersey. Prior to that, he held a similar position at Emory University in Atlanta. His current research is focused on data services in academic libraries, and he has begun exploring pedagogical approaches to teaching undergraduates with data. Take it away. Great. Th thank you, Kelly. Thanks very much for that intro. And thank you, Jared, Karate, and Chelsea for that interesting update about OpenICPSR. So with respect to publishing methods, which is the overarching theme of this session, um, Sean and I are also considering some similar topics, although we've taken a much different focus. We're looking very specifically at deposit forms or other guidelines for university institutional repositories, IRs, to try to determine how or even if these guidelines enable data discovery data that researchers might want for reuse, reproducibility, or for complete repurposing. So we carried forward the data by design theme from the unfortunately canceled 2020 ISS conference for which this presentation was originally planned. As that conference was meant to take place in Scandinavia, the hotbed of modern design, we sought to analogize the form follows function dictum from the modern design world with the relationship between documentation for deposit and data discovery. So we directed our focus onto academic IRs, which are structured by design to accommodate collection and dissemination of a wide variety of scholarly content, not just data and data sets. Once the word fumble made its way into our title, 
our thoughts naturally turn to football. Uh, that is uh, American football, where the ball isn't black and white. And in fact, it's not even a round ball. And we, we were inspired by the most persistent American footballer of our lifetimes, good old Charlie Brown. Just as Lucy sets up the football for Charlie Brown to showcase his prodigious performance, so too do academic IRs hold out great promise and potential. But just as we've seen how Lucy repeatedly pulls away the football, we questioned if we might observe that the IR model reflected at many academic institutions might actually inhibit this potential and cause users to fumble around in their attempts at data discovery within these IRs. So with that question looming, Sean is going to talk a bit more about the motivation and methodology that we undertook in pursuit of an answer. Yeah, so in addition to being influenced by the conference theme and our cartoon muse, Charles Schultz, we found grounding, motivation, and genuine inspiration from recent policy and principal pronouncements. With focused attention on open access, data repositories, and broad sharing, national organizations like the United States OSTP and cross-national groups like Coalition S, we found a push for transparency and openness of scholarly objects. And of course, the FAIR principles begin with the most important F and findable. Next slide, please. Here we see ISIS luminaries, Anne Green and Myron Gutman, writing in 2006 and seven. And they remind us that the conversation has deep roots and a long history. And more importantly, that repositories of all types will do well to work in concert. It was though a chance read that proved the greatest impetus for our investigation. Writing in 2019, Kim et al. explored data repositories in archaeology and zoology, investigating how deposit forms perform in gathering descriptive metadata. In the end, Kim et al. suggests repositories, specifically data repositories, should require additional elements, namely study level information. Next slide, please. So we set out to investigate an international sample of institutionally based multi-domain repositories often commonly referred to as IRs. For our universe, we first turned to an article from Sandy and Dykus. They generate a list of US-based IRs for their staffing study. We included all 50 of their original data in our universe. Again, with an aim for an international sample, we then turned to the Open Door, the Directory of Open Access Repositories. It is a UK-based website that lists academic open access repositories around the world. We used Open Doors API to extract a JSON file with a range of elements. Institutional repository name, the URL, the software underlying the IR, country of origin, and language. And language was of crucial importance to us as our work focused on English language only. Massaging the JSON file with OpenRefine, we then created a data file in Microsoft Excel and combined that with the Sandy and Dicus data. We made use of Microsoft Excel's random number generator and then sorted for the top 40. We all know Terrence loves his top 40. The sample country breakdown nicely mirrored our percent of the universe. And you can see that in the chart to the right. And we had uh, samples from Australia, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Singapore, the United Kingdom, as well as the United States. Next slide, please. So again, drawing on Kim et al, we developed a coding scheme that would allow us to explore deposit forms, IR staff mediation, 
the existence of data, as well as an in-depth review of the Dublin Core. The Dublin Core metadata element set is a vocabulary of 15 properties for use in resource description. While Kim et al. focused on reuse of data, we explored metadata in its fullest and whether or not IRs enable data discovery. Next slide, please. It is, after all, not hyperbolic to say, metadata saves the world. And what you see here is a graphical representation we created to capture the essence of a 2019 Scarlet Kitchen blog post by Meadows. What we, what we want you to take away from this is that there's a need of several actors, the creators, the custodians, the consumers, all working in concert toward the collective goals of discovery, use, reuse, and interoperability. Terrence will now walk us through some of our chief findings. Ah, thanks very much, Sean. So what did we discover? Well, a primary focus of our examination of these 40 academic IRs was consistency of metadata standards. And we found identifiable Dublin Core elements in 90% of the IRs in our sample, with more than 90% of that 90% having seven or more Dublin Core elements. It was disappointing, however, but probably not surprising as these academic IRs are not primarily focused on research data curation to observe that none of the deposit guidelines or sample records showed the use of DDI. That is the standards developed under the data documentation initiative of which Jared Lyle is the director for describing data. And now before I move on, I do need to acknowledge that within the online chat that took place during yesterday's excellent session on data visualization, several persons expressed their disdain for pie charts. I have to apologize for not realizing that pie charts were such a catalyst for so much ill will. So for those of you who haven't already abandoned this session because of the pie charts that were displayed earlier, I do need to offer this trigger warning. The next few slides include pie charts. So you may want to avert your eyes and ensure that children and pets and other sensitive creatures are not in peril of being traumatized by what's about to be displayed. So focusing on other indicators of uniformity and consistency, we found that some form of controlled vocabulary was clearly in use in a little more than half of the IRs in our sample. Unfortunately, the large number of IRs for which we couldn't determine this, you can see that was more than one third of the IRs in our sample, brought to light an unanticipated snag that we hadn't foreseen when we set out to do this project. That is, many of the IRs maintain all of their deposit forms, guidelines, and other instructions for authors behind a login and password wall, so we were unable to examine them. We also looked for evidence of some sort of, some sort of human-mediated oversight before final data deposit where an IR staff member either handles the entire deposit function process or provides administrative review before any self-deposit goes live. We found this in 60% of the IRs in our sample. As you can see, only a very small percentage seem to embrace the total anarchy of unmediated self-deposit. And again, unfortunately, for nearly one third of the IRs, we had to include that, conclude that we, we just don't know. And finally, again, acknowledging that we were searching for the data needle in the IR haystack, we found that data or data sets was specifically mentioned in deposit forms or guidelines or in a description of potential IR content or in a list of content format types in just over half that the 40% plus 12% of the IRs in our sample. And now Sean will wrap things up for us. Yeah, so what we see to the right here, in the same way our cartoon Lucy longs for clarity in the relationship with Schroeder, reflecting upon our results, we arrived at numerous questions 
where we believe we might best learn from you. It would have been all the better if this could have continued at the banquet, but alas, here we are in the virtual world. Next slide, please. So we'd like to wrap up by just saying thank you and we welcome any questions that our talk may have raised and hope that you can help us advance our scholarship as well. Thank you very much, Terrence and Sean. I feel like we're gonna to have to start a pie chart support group or something to that effect. Uh, all right, great. We are making excellent time. Thank you so much. Our third and final presentation today is called Crafting a Sustainable Reproducibility Service and Archive. And our speaker is Linda Kellum, someone we are all familiar with, hopefully. She is a senior data librarian at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. Linda supports researchers in data management workflows, data curation, and social science and historical data discovery. She manages the Sizer Data and Reproduction Archive and provided project support for the Freedom on the Move database of runaway slave ads. She received her master's in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, her MLIS from UNC Greensboro, and is a doctoral candidate in history. In addition, she is the current chair of the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Can you all hear me okay? Um, yes. Okay. Great, oh, perfect. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for those excellent presentations. My name is Linda Kellum. I'm the data librarian at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences, which might be a new um, uh, title for some of you. Uh, Sizer has now been made part of the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. Um, before I begin, I want to recognize that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with an historic presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell, New York State, and the United States of America, and we acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and water. Um, so I am going to talk about um, our, uh, so I started working at Sizer, or now CCS, in July 2019. And my first task when I arrived was the redevelopment of the Sizer data archive. Um, and we successfully launched it in 2020 during a pandemic. Um, so we're very happy about that. And today I'm gonna re talk about the challenges we faced in the re redevelopment, the solutions we decided on and the future. Um, and I'm not presenting this as any kind of solution for all, anyone, this is what worked for us. Um, my goal for this presentation is really to have a discussion about well, first off, managing similar projects. Secondly, the place of reproducibility packages in traditional archives, which has been touched on previously. And three, um, we are open to ideas for improvements and any um, suggestions people have. So let us know if you do have uh, suggestions for us. Uh, before updating the archive required teamwork and lots of it, this wasn't something um, I was only involved in. There were many people who were involved. Um, we have a great combination of, within a very small shop, I will say that, we have a great combination of programming skills, archival knowledge, institutional knowledge, and reproducibility experiences with our ARC squared service, which I'll talk about in a minute. And a couple of my colleagues hopefully are here today too, um, Florio Argilis, who runs R squared, and Jonathan Bohan, who is the data archive specialist. And if you do put a question in the chat, they would be able to answer it that way if you have questions while I'm going through. Um, but they're, they're on hand to answer your questions if you have them. So the challenge that we had is that Sizer Data Archive, thanks to the, uh, the efforts of Anne Green, who was mentioned before, um, has existed since the 1980s, um, and others too, Pam Baxter, lots of different data librarians were part of this, um, this institute. Um, and the database and online interface were created in the late 1990s and adjusted over time. That original archive worked well for traditional data studies, but it has needed an update for new data needs. And uh, one of those main needed data needs was related to our reproducibility services that uh, I'll talk about. So reproducibility, we had a wonderful session on Monday, was that Monday? Gosh, Monday about reproducibility uh, and some definitions were given. 
Um, so reproducibility, the definition we're using is the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials and procedures as were used by the original investigator. Uh, and this definition call, or this report um, called on research funded by the NSF to have good enough documentation of the procedures used so that secondary researchers could produce similar results. Around the same time as the, this discussion, the report, um, there was also discussion in or the article in Nature about the reproducibility crisis. Around that same time, Sizer created what's called the Results Reproduction or R squared service. And this is the service that Floria manages. Um, R squared is a computa computational reproducibility service for researchers at Cornell. Uh, researchers send data and code to the R squared team. They run the code and check against the original manuscript and then discuss discrepancies with the researchers. They then rerun the code and do, iterate that process as necessary. And the end result is a, is a zipped package that contains a final version of data and code. And this is um, Florio's workflow for that process. And it starts up at the top with, on the left with client deposits. Um, and within that main box is uh, where you see um, R squared team doing its its thing, doing a wonderful work. And then down the bottom, when we had the package come out, um, there was a, we needed to figure out how to best highlight those packages within our archive. Um, when r -Square as a service was originally created, um, the packages were kind of included into the uh, archive without adjusting um, for their unique needs. And we wanted to consider how we could better highlight them um, within the archive. So there were several considerations that we had um, as well as needs um, when we started this process. One uh, is the big question and this one we talked about for several couple of months. Um, should we overhaul, overhaul the existing archive, just start over um, with what we had or to tweak the legacy archive or three, use an external product. Um, and we, uh, well, I'll talk about what we decided in a second. Um, we, number two, we, how do we balance short-term access versus long-term preservation? This is something that we heard in ICPSR's presentation. This is definitely something we talked about a lot and we're still talking about uh, at, at CCSS. And then three, how do we accommodate different types of data holdings? Um, so how do we best highlight our R squared packages? Um, four, what workflows are required to, in, between the data archive team and our R squared team? Five, what ways um, could we better integrate fair data principles more and, and integrate them more explicitly? There were definitely um, fair, our archive predated fair, um, but there were, and there was definitely in the, within the original archive um, an understanding of fair data principles or those principles, um, but we wanted to do that more explicitly. And then finally, what solution would be flexible enough for future development? So now we'll talk a little bit about our solutions. And this is not the end, end point. Um, there's always ongoing development in anything that you create. Um, so this is our uh, new data and reproduction archive. Um, the back end database needed to be completely refreshed um, because it had been tacked onto for many years um, as uh, personnel changed or um, there were certain needs that came up. Uh, some fields weren't as well documented over the years as they, they might have been, could have been. Um, so we created an entire new backend. Um, all fields were mapped to the DDI codebook and controlled vocabularies, um, both DDI as well as um, other controlled vocabularies. And then we um, used Library of Congress authority files throughout the archive. The front end, um, we wanted to work to showcase our R squared holdings, like I said, alongside the more traditional archive offerings. Um, and the reason why this became important is because R squared is where we see growth for our archive. Um, Sizer, the Sizer data archive used to be the main point for Cornell to access ICPSR and Roper Center um, data holdings, and that's no longer the, the mission of this archive. So as we grow our R squared services, we wanted to find ways to make them more um, discoverable. So this is just the search um, screen when you go in and look at um, do a, a look at the search screen. Um, and we kept three legacy tags, the Cornell authored tag, um, Sizer enhanced tag, and the R squared tag. Um, on this screen, you'll see Cornell authored and Sizer enhanced, and those are the two 
um, that were, like I said, they were pre-existing um, in the old archives. Uh, Sizer enhanced meant that um, the data librarian at the time would um, maybe create a, uh, anonymize the data or create a subset or do something that's particular on the data set. Um, that particular tag, because we do interact with a lot of the data, um, that particular tag we might um, discontinue over time. In addition, we added faceted searching on the side. So um, this is not new for most people, but it was definitely something we were very excited to integrate into our archive. Um, one of the things that you'll see on the previous screen, sorry, is that you can separate out the holding types. So the studies are all the original studies that we have and the reproduction packages are this, these um, R squared packages that we, um, we were trying to highlight. And if somebody clicks on that, it will allow them to see all of the R squared packages, um, which include the R squared symbol in addition to Cornell authored. All of them are Cornell authored at this point because um, we do not offer the service currently to outside researchers, but it's something that we're looking at in the future. Um, for an R squared entry, we have added um, several, many features actually, and we have more coming. One is just persistent identifiers for the authors, as well as the DOI for every package, every study um, that we have. Uh, we have a citation of the R squared package that hopefully people will use. And then we also have a citation for the referenced article, um, the original article that uh, we are reproducing. And then it, up at the top, you'll see along the tabs, uh, related articles um, tab, that is to include anybody who cites the um, manuscript or cites the, sorry, cites the article or cites the R squared package. Um, and of course that one is still, we don't have a lot of those yet, um, but we're hoping over time we'll be able to see more and more people using our R squared packages. In addition, the last thing we added was for this, um, was the uh, views and the downloads. So people can see metrics uh, of how many um, downloads they've had and how many views they've had on their packages. Um, sorry. <laughs> the other thing we did, I'm not gonna have time to talk about this one much, is that we changed our restriction level indicators. We went from a red, yellow, red, green, yellow, red stoplight uh, format to using uh, a more granular format uh, for restriction levels. And this is based on the Harvard data tags, but we did modify this a bit um, based on user feedback um, in the way people thought it should actually go. So I can talk about that later if you're interested in that. So going into the future, um, those are the basic changes that we've had. And uh, there's definitely some lessons that we've learned and considerations for the future. Uh, one is the question of how to sustain over time. We are, want to be nimble and respond to changes in the data ecosystem. Um, but we, which is why we decided to build our own system, even though we're a pretty small shop. Um, but we realized that we need to plan for future developments, which might potentially mean integrating with other resources or other um, tools. But before we do that, we have to, we need to step back and um, create more explicit workflows between our teams, R squared and data archive, um, and not just treat R squared packages as something that can be thrown up into um, the data archive, um, but that we actually consider the unique needs of those particular packages. Second is this idea of spring cleaning, um, which I, I came across this year um, in the archives, apparent, in traditional library archives, uh, there is a tendency to take a day for spring cleaning when you can go through and clean your own files on your computer um, or, and use the day just to, to make sure things are in order. Um, and we've been trying to institute some of those practices in our workflows um, to try and help us go back and really think through how we're do documenting and how we're um, looking at things. And then finally, being willing to start over. Um, our old database was tacked onto and the documentation had fallen off a little bit. Uh, as a result, some people really knew the fields very well, but others uh, did not. So things needed to be in transparent, needed to be transparent for the entire team and not just for certain people. Um, so we did rebuild the structure and give it full documentation so it could be transferable to um, personnel in the future um, and be understandable into the future. The next thing is that short-term needs versus long-term preservation question that, I, that the previous presenters talked about. Um, R squared has a, the need for a quick turnaround of manuscripts. 
Um, whereas our goal uh, mission for the data archive is the goal is long term preservation. And so we're still talking through how do we both provide quick turnaround as well as uh, long term preservation. And we do consider these um, our R squared packages. We want them to be available for the long term. Um, we think that's an important part of um, our work. Um, third is coalition building. We don't. We try not to do this in a vacuum. We reached out to the Cornell University Libraries and other groups to get feedback. Uh, stakeholders who are very interested in this, um, and they definitely provided feedback. They would helped us um, with the tags, for instance. But uh, and we also understand that other repositories aren't our competitors. Um, that we complement each other. So we've been working with the Cornell University Libraries eCommons. Um, which is the institutional repository to see how we can integrate our workflows. Um, potentially, they archive the articles and we archive the data sets or um, the data. But uh, the other aspect of this is that Cornell's data retention policy does see the data as a, something that should stay with Cornell and have a connection to Cornell um, and something that's very important for us. So we want to figure out how we can best highlight Cornell you know, research um, and work with other repositories uh, to figure out ways that we might be able to highlight our research. So there are future developments. There's still lots to do. Um, again, I mentioned integration with other services. Now that our databases have been redone, we have the possibility that we might integrate with other services a little bit more easily. Uh, also development of backend reporting. That's one thing that we need to do. And finally is cost recovery models. Uh, Lorio can talk more about this. Uh, R-squared is looking into the possibility of cost recovery models for the service itself. Uh, and then we are also looking at, and within the data archive, the possibility of cost recovery should we need to because of the size of the packages um, and the, the, the space, storage space that we're using. So those are the, the main things that we've been doing at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. Um, if you have any suggestions or comments, let us know. Great, thank you, Linda. It's a great presentation. It's exciting to see to see where you are in this process for sure. All right, so we do have some some great questions. We have one hand raised, which I'm going to take care of first so that I don't lose it. Hold on just a second. Florio, I believe that's you. Let's see here. I'm going to allow you to talk. All right, you should be able to talk. <laughs> Sorry, I just accidentally actually pressed the button. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, muted, muted again. We're going back to the we'll go back to the Q and A's. Uh, let's see, there were a lot of good questions here. Um, one for the ICPSR team: After ten years of open ICPSR, how are download reuse metrics? Um, for the self-deposited versus the curated data? How are those metrics looking right now? Or is there anything specifically you'd like to say about that? Yeah, so um, hi, Firla. I think Firla was the one who asked this. Yeah. Um, good, to, good to see your question. Um, this actually fits in with the other question that uh, is there. If you had to do it over again, how would you have integrated ICPSR? and open ICPSR. So the usage statistics are not well integrated uh, between the systems. And so we're not able to uh, adequately measure that at this point. And so we're looking to, to actually integrate the, the usage metrics so we can measure that. Um, I think that, you know, that relates to the question, how would we do it over? Well, obviously we wouldn't have built uh, a completely separate system um, that, uh, for instance, the usage metrics in open ICPSR are um, an improvement on providing usage metrics at the variable level, I'm sorry, at the, the file level. And so there's some cool new functionality there, um, but it was built from scratch and it wasn't integrated with our main system. And so we're not able to, to actually adequately measure that right now. Um, and and give you you know specific details about how they compare. I will say, um, looking at Google Analytics, just usage of the site, it's a well-trafficked site compared to even some of our topical archives. So you know we have um, funded archives by different funding agencies, and um, you look at Open ICPSR, it's not it doesn't get quite the usage as 
our main ICPSR collections, but just looking at overall web traffic, it's, it's highly trafficked um, overall. Thank you. Uh, there was a question for Sean and Terrence. Um, there, there were two actually related, but so one of them was answered, uh, but this one I'll ask out loud. Based on your findings, uh, could you describe the elements of an effective deposit uh, review for an institutional repository? And could you explain further the importance of including the mention of DDI in the deposit form? Good question. Um, I, I'm not sure, th and I hope that, that Sean will jump in and, and uh, clarify things for me. Um, we didn't necessarily set out to determine best practices for creating metadata or, or tagging for IRs. Um, our, our main goal was, was just observational uh, to see if you given the, the nature of academic IRs, which is that they have to accommodate all kinds of content, um, we, we wanted to explore the extent to which uh, they, they might support data deposit, you know, particularly with, a, with the outlook of, of possible data discovery. And, you know, if the, the answer might be that, you know, given the the, the need to accommodate all, all kinds of content, it, it just might be untenable to ever develop metadata standards that are specific to such a tiny subset of academic IR content, which would be data or data sets. So while academic IRs are likely, you know, that th they serve a very good purpose uh, for storage and some dissemination, folks who are, are looking to find data um, probably are, are likely to point themselves elsewhere at, at, as a starting point. And perhaps what we've done is, is just confirm that that's likely to continue to be the case for a while. I just add and highlight the uh, Kim et al. Uh, article that we referenced and they specifically were looking at uh, sort of exemplars of what metadata sets are necessary to surface uh, data better, but their focus was on data repositories uh, full stop. And so we were trying to take that thought and, and find data as uh, Terrence uh, said in the, the needle in the uh, IR haystack. Um, and so the Kim et al might answer your question about uh, what data elements they believe after their investigation are the necessary ones to highlight uh, and surface data. Uh, and then the question about DDI, uh, we just looked at that as a descriptor, uh, not being metadata experts ourselves. We were just curious, um, knowing from this community, uh, even though we're not metadata experts, we've been around enough to know that it matters. And so we were curious, uh, does that exist in the, uh, the generalist IR environment? So we were just looking at it from a descriptive perspective, uh, essentially yes, no, um, uh, bimodal. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, there was one here for Linda that we wanted to answer all together. How do you go about collecting related literature for your R squared collection? Do you automate this in any way? I wish, and Elizabeth, we should talk about this probably, I think, because um, I recognize your name from my CQSR. So um, yeah, uh, definitely, um, I, Jonathan, I think, wishes we could do that too, um, but uh, it is something that we've not been able to automate. <laughs> yeah, he just said yes in the chat. Um, so if it's definitely some, if it's something that um, we could talk about and collaborate on, that would be very helpful. But it, no, at this time, it's not something that we were automating. Yeah. Um, we were just getting through the rebuild. Um, the next step, I think, would be to look at those kinds of things where we could um, automate our processes a little bit more. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we just have maybe time for one more. I conscious of making sure everybody gets a chance to make it to the next session on time. Um, let's see here. A lot of these have already been answered, which is great. Um, and again, any of these questions that have not been answered, or if you'd like to kind of do some follow-ups, they will be transferred into the Whova platform. So you'll be able to find all of that content there. Um, 
let's see here. Oh, there's another one here for you, Linda. I think we could, it, could you speak a little bit about the metadata differences in the data archives versus uh, the reproduction service? And she asks, this is Cheryl Thompson is asking because she's been pondering a metadata block for verification and re reproducibility for, for, their, for her archive. Yeah, at this particular point, and Jonathan might be able to throw something in here too. At this particular point, one of the things we did was just um, create a separate, create them as separate entries, separate holdings, so that we could build out any kind of metadata that we thought would be unique to um, the R squared. But it, I don't think at this time that we have any metadata that's particularly unique, but we did want it to be set up so that we could do that if we wanted to, it needed to in the future if we saw some reason. Um, oh yeah, and the separate citation for the journal articles, that's the main difference um, that Jonathan mentions. Uh, whereas in the, the, the data studies themselves, there wouldn't be that citation for the related ar um, article. Uh, their citation article is what we use. There's the, you can have related articles like the bibliography um, articles that have used the data study, um, but with the uh, um, reproducibility packages, we wanted to have the manuscript highlighted in there. And so that's one main difference that we have right now. But there is a possibility for more. And again, that's why we built them separately so that we could expand um, in the future if we needed to. Okay. All right, I don't want to be blocking the special guests. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Thanks. Yeah, no, this is great. We're wrapping up right on time. I actually have a question for the ICPSR folks that I will put in the thing about uh, any experiences with, with people taking data out uh, and any challenges you may have had uh, with um, unpublishing stuff. So, but I will put that in the in the Whova platform. So, thank you all very much. And Don't before we wrap up, I would like to thank everybody for all the pie love that came through on yes. on the, the chat. That was uh, very heartening. <laughs> All right, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our participants and we will see you in the next session.